So for this session, we are to talk about your, your exam transactions. So for exam transactions, always remember that these business transactions are either business transactions are either taxable or they are exempt. So when we talk about taxable or exempt business transactions, we are dealing with business tax. So whether they are taxable under business tax or are they exempt? So first, we need to determine, is it exempt so that we will tax it or we will not tax it? That's why we need to learn first your exempt transactions. At the end of this particular session, we must know the treatment of your exempt transactions and we must know the different types or the different exempt business transactions. So we discussed first what is an exempt transaction. Again, when we talk about your exempt transactions, these are transactions not subject to any business tax. So remember, when we talk about your business or your consumption, we have your domestic importation and your exportation. Generally, exportation is exempt due to your destination principle. And your domestic and importation are normally taxable. The question now is, when is it considered exempt? When is it considered exempt? So we need to determine what are the exempt domestic sales and what are the exempt importation. Again, when I talk about sales, this pertains to the sale of goods properties, or services. Remember, we already classified the sales as either the sales of goods or properties and as either the sale of services or lease of properties. And we also talk about their uh, tax basis. So gross selling price or gross receipts. Okay? So... Why do we say it is an exempt transaction? Because if it's an exempt transaction, we will not subject it to any business tax. And when we say business tax, that is either OPT or value-added tax plus excise tax. Do not forget this one. OPT plus excise tax but plus excise tax. But for excise tax, this is only an ad valorem. So when we say ad valorem, only when certain types of goods or services is imposed with excise tax. So there will be no VAT, no OPT, or no excise tax. So uh, what is the reason or rationally why we have these exempt transactions? The first rationally why we have these exempt transactions is because of your necessity and for nation building. Why for necessity? Remember, a consumption tax by its nature adds to the value or cost of a particular good or service. So it adds additional costs for the good or service. And one rationale why, they, why we have exempt transactions is your necessity and nation building. First necessity, because it is for human necessity a particular good or service is for human necessity or that particular human necessity is known as your food and other products. Okay, So if that particular uh, item of a good or service is for human necessity, we should not add additional tax for its consumption. Why? Because it is used for day-to-day operations or for day-to-day -day use. So for example, your food, if we will add additional tax for your food, what happens is there will be an increase as to the price of your food or commodity. By the increase of your food or commodity, this will affect your consumption on your food or commodity. And that food or commodity, since it is for your human necessity or for your necessity, we must not include or add more cost to it so that it will be more accessible to more 
users or to more consumers. So some examples of your human necessity as we go through are your food, your food products, your agricultural products, your marine products. Those are for uh, necessity. Another is for nation building. So when we say for nation building, this is to promote, uh, of course, the building of our economy, particularly Philippine economy. So uh, not only for a particular business enterprise, but also uh, to meet the different uh, goals of our constitution, such as your education, your health. Okay, so those are important uh, aspects of nation building. So we include those as exempt transactions. So later we will discuss education, health services. Those items are exempt transactions. Another rationale of your uh, exempt transaction is your tax incentive. These tax incentives normally is good for your promotion of business and other transactions or essential services. So this tax incentive is only applicable to certain business transactions or business services or a business entity. For example, your cooperatives. Uh, what else under your exemptions? Uh, we have your transportation, particularly your air and cargo or passenger transportation. So this uh, particular service or a particular business transaction is exempted to promote our tax, to promote tax incentives. Next, we go to another uh, reason or rationale why we have your exempt transactions. Number three, we have your international committee. So this is to promote international, international committee between uh, Philippines and your foreign government. So, Philippines and foreign government will enter into treaties, international agreements, or some laws so that uh, cons consumption in between them are exempt. Okay? So again, why do we have exempt transactions? Due to necessity and nation building, due to tax incentives on certain business, and then international committee for your Philippines and foreign government consumption. Now we go through your different exam transactions. We go now to your first exam transaction. So first is your food products in their original state. So letter A, so the sale or importation of agricultural and marine food products in their original state, livestock and poultry of a kind generally used as or yielding or producing foods for human consumption and breeding stock and genetic materials therefore so there are many items that is exempt under this particular provision so the first exempt here is the sale of agricultural and marine food products another is the importation of agricultural and marine food products so this Food products in original state applies both to whether it is a domestic sale or an importation. Okay, so take note. We need to know whether a particular domestic sale or an importation is an is an exempt transaction. Therefore, we go to this letter A, which provides that uh, importation and for uh, domestic sale the food products in original state are exempt, okay? So another, we have your livestock, so sale or importation of livestock, and then poultry are also exempt. We need to know now what is the definition of a livestock, marine food products, and then original state. So we start first with your livestock. So what items under your livestock or what items of different agri products or agri or agri livestocks are subject to uh, tax and which are exempt. So under the law, it is provided that livestock include cows, bulls, calves, pigs, sheep, goats, and rabbits. These are only the livestock. Again, 
for livestock, take note, before we will exempt a particular transaction, the rule is that it must be specifically provided under the law. Okay? You know already that one under your income taxation, that uh, taxation uh, is the lifeblood of the government. And because of this, uh, exemptions are strictly construed against the taxpayer. Therefore, you must always point out the specific provision of the law for you to claim an exemption. So here, under the law, we said that under letter A, we have your different exemptions. These are your agricultural and marine food products. We have your livestock. We have your poultry. So we need to know what are these items of agri-food products, such as your livestock and poultry, and what are your marine food products. So under your agri-food products, we have your livestock and poultry. We first discuss what is a livestock. Livestock only includes the following. Cows, bulls, calves, pigs, sheep, goats, and rabbits. Therefore, if that particular livestock is not included on this enumeration, then it is taxable. If it's cow, bull, cow, pig, sheep, goat, or rabbit, it is exempt. Now we go to poultry. So on your agri, livestock, or poultry. So under your poultry, what are the different items? Is specifically exempt under the law. The following are items of poultry. So fowls, ducks, geese, and turkey. Okay. And also, the law includes already those which are subject to business tax. What are those? Fighting cops, raised horses, zoo animals, and other animals generally considered as pets. So dogs are subject to VAT. So if you are engaged into the sale or importation of dogs, you are subject to VAT. How about cat? Yes, you are again subject to VAT or subject to OPT. It depends whether you are VATable or not. Okay? So again, for agri, livestock, and poultry, take note of the items that are subject and not subject. So those exempt are already specifically provided under the law, and those that are subject to business tax are also provided. So example are fighting cops, race horses, zoo animals, and other animals that are considered as pets. So we're then defining what is an agricultural product in the context of this subsection. We go now to the definition of a marine food product in the concept of this subsection. First, marine food products include fish and crustaceans, but not limited to eels, trout, lobster, shrimps, prawns, oysters, mussels, and clams. So any fish and crustacean is uh, exempt under our law as a marine food products. Take note, livestock and poultry, which are agricultural food products in their original state, are exempt. So these are cows, bulls, calves, pigs, fowls, ducks, geese, and turkey. Marine food products in their original state includes fish and crustaceans. Sir, what do we mean by in their original state? that live livestock, poultry, or marine food products, or if ever that particular agri or marine food products are processed already, is still considered in original state. So the question now here is, you know that agri food products and marine food products are exempt. So we have specific uh, provisions as to this. Now the question is, when do we consider it as an as a food product in original state. Is it still alive so that we can say it is in original state or it can already be uh, chopped into pieces so that we can consider it under original state? So when do we consider a food product in original state? It is considered in original state even if they have undergone the simple processes of preparation, preservation, and packaging. So the following are items under your original state. If it undergone simple processes of preparation, preservation, or packaging. So what are the processes of preparation and preservation? So 
the processes of preparation and preservation are freezing, drying, salting, broiling, roasting, smoking, or stripping. So now, if you smoke or you roast those poultry or livestock or those marine food products, they are still in original state. Therefore, it does not mean na kailangang ibenta mo yung agri or marine food product in original state or buhay na buhay para masabing in original state. They, they can be freezed, they can be dried, they can be salted, broiled, roasted, smoked, or stripped. So a smoked fish is considered in original state. So if that particular meat or fruit or fish or vegetables and other agri or marine food products are salted, broiled, or prepared or preserved, then they are still in original state. Sir, how about a lechon? So we have here a lechon manok or lechon baboy. Lechon baka? Can it be? Yes, I think. So anything that can be, ro they are roasted, right? They are roasted, therefore, they are considered in original state. However, I have a problem regarding this preparation or preservation. So if you have here a raw meat, raw meat, if it is a raw meat, then it's still in original state. If it is already smoked, it is still in original state. Even if it is freezed or salted or dried, it is still in original state. But take note, if the raw meat is already marinated, it is not in original state. So for example, we have here a meat, nil, uh, gumawa ka ng tapa. Di ba normally tapa, nilalagyan mo siya ng kung ano-anong ingredients. Hindi ko alam, basta may na-marinate ata siya. So if you already marinated that raw meat, so for example, you have a meat shop, if you only sell the raw meat, the raw meat itself is exempt on a business tax. But if you created barbecue, tapa, etc., out of that raw meat, those items are already not in original state, therefore subject to business tax. So only on these items of preparation and preservation, freezing, drying, salting, broiling, roasting, smoking, and stripping, can we say that the particular food product is in original state? What food products again? If we talk about food products, we have only two. We have your agri food products and your marine food products. What are your agri food products? This can be under your livestock or poultry. Okay. Next, we also do we also have those items under packaging. So if ever it is already packaged, we can still consider them in original state. So when can we say that it is already packaged? So the following: if it is under shrink wrapping in plastics, vacuum packing. Tetra pack and other similar packaging methods. So if that is raw meat and then it is already wrapped in a uh, tetra pack or in a shrink wrapping in plastics, uh, I don't know if you already seen a particular product wherein there, uh, the product was placed inside the plastic bag and then it is vacuumed so that the air, uh, the air is already vacuumed and then it is already wrapped in that particular plastic. So that particular packaging, even if that meat is already packaged, it's still considered in original state. Therefore, what we look into your original state is that they are still in their raw form. Okay, so if they are still in the raw form, even if it is already packaged, that food product is still in original state. Okay. So that is about your packaging, okay? So long as its raw form is not altered because it is already prepared or preserved. Sir, pwede bang prepared and preserved na siya plus package? Yes, anything as long as it is still boils down to the definition of an original state. Because once it is not in original state, it is subject to business tax. Okay, how about your sugar? When can we consider it as in original state. 
So the rules on your sugar uh, depends whether it is already uh, processed or not. So take note, guys, that we only look into your raw sugar as an original state. So sugar, if it's already processed, and the content of its sucrose by weight in the dry state has a polarimeter reading of 99.5 degrees and above are presumed to be refined sugar. So it is raw sugar, original state. So when is it refined sugar? So if it's raw sugar, the rule is it is less than 99.5 degrees. But if it's more than 99.5 degrees, it is already considered as a refined sugar. Further, if the cane sugar is presumed or uh, it produ if produced by the following, it's presumed to be a refined sugar. Okay. So if ever we have a cane sugar and it is produced by the following, it is presumed to be a refined sugar. So the following, first we have your product of a refining process or it is from a sugar refinery or in a production line of a sugar mill. So if ever any of the businesses will have a cane sugar, that particular cane sugar, although it is still in raw form, if it is produced by the following items, are, they are already considered as refined sugar. So again, a cane sugar, if it is produced by the following businesses, they are already considered as a refined sugar. So generally, a cane sugar really is a raw sugar. However, if this particular, any of the three business will produce that, it is already considered as refined sugar. Why? Look at these types of businesses. Refining process, sugar refinery, production line of e-sugar mills. So do, normally, these businesses engage into refinery. So they refine products. So if ever, if you have a cane sugar and produced by a business that uh, caters refinery, of course, the output of that business is a refined sugar. So even if it does not meet the 99.5 degrees ratio, if it is from these businesses, it is still considered as a refined sugar. Okay. So raw sugar, the rule is that it is an original state. But when is it considered as a refined sugar? Therefore, subject to business tax, it is considered as a refined sugar if ever we have your 99.5 degrees greater than its polarimeter degree. Or if the business caters refinery. Okay? We go now to your uh, different agri products. And how do we consider them? as either original or not in original state. So we have these different products. We have your polish or has rice, corn grits, raw cane sugar and molasses, ordinary salt and copra is still considered as agri agricultural food products in their original state. So even if the rice is already polished or has, even if the corn is already greeted, it is still considered as in their original state. So if ever you have a corn and then uh, natanggal na yung, yung different corn dun sa parang cone niya, it's still considered as original state. So even if the rice is already has or polished, it's still in original state. Okay? So in this in this exemption, letter A, take note, we have your agri-food products and your marine food products. They must be in their original state. So that is in your raw form. However, there is an exemption to this. It is still considered in original state if ever it undergone certain preservation or preparation. So preparation or preservation. So what are the different preparation or preservation again? Freezing, drying, salting, broiling, roasting, smoking, or stripping. Take note, if it is an exemption, you must be specific on the items. So whatever is provided under the law, yun lang yung exempt. If it's not included, such as your marination, it is still, uh, it is already exempt. So it must be specifically included. If it's excluded, it is not exempt. 
Next, we go to your farm or fishery inputs. Farm or fishery inputs are also considered as exempt transactions. Why? Because again, these are used for human consumption. So ultimately, if you have your farm or fishery inputs, this farm or fishery inputs is used, of course, to produce either agri products or marine products. So in short, you still need this one so that you have agri or marine products. So both farm and fishery inputs together with the produce, which is the agri product or marine product, are exempt under the law. Why are they exempt again? This is for human food products. Okay, so let's read the provision of the law. So sale or importation of fertilizers, seeds, seedlings, and fingerlings, fish, fish prawn, livestock, and poultry feeds, including ingredients, whether locally produced or imported, used in the manufacture of finished feeds, except specialty feeds for race horses, fighting cocks, aquarium fish, zoo animals, and other animals generally considered as pets. We already know that if ever the agri or marine product is considered as pet, then this is not uh, included as an exempt transaction, okay? So if ever you have your farm or fishery inputs such as your fertilizers or seedlings, these items are also exempt. Of course, your fertilizers can be uh, used on your fingerlings still or your seedlings. Seedlings is for agri products normally. Fingerlings is used for your marine products, okay? So including feeds, they are exempt. Including feeds, they are exempt. So it is specifically for your livestock, poultry, or marine. Take note, if it is already fit for human consumption, it is already subject to tax. Why? Because take note, these feeds, these feeds must be for your marine or agricultural product, not for human consumption. So kung yung feed na yan is for human consumption, it is subject to tax. Okay? So ano yung mga nandito? Fertilizers. Seedlings and fingerlings, also feeds, whether it is domestic or imported. Okay? Fertilizers, seedlings and fingerlings, or feeds. Why? Yung fertilizers, of course, mampataba ng mga seedlings or fingerlings mo. Ano ba yung seedlings and fingerlings mo? So let's say you are into farming and you have a certain fish pond. Hindi naman basta may tubig doon magkakaroon na ng fish. Siyempre, kailangan mo lagyan ng maliliit na fish hanggang lumaki sila. So yung maliliit na fish na yon are considered fingerlings. So yung maliliit na fish na yon binibigyan mo siya ng feeds para uh, may makain sila, of course. So uh, those feeds are also considered as farm or fishery inputs. Therefore, it is exempt. How about your seedlings? So your seedlings uh, for your agri products, let's say, you have seedlings for agri products. Ano naman yung input mo doon? Yung fertilizer. So take note, your farm, including uh, farm inputs or fishery inputs are exempt. So they must be particularly for marine and agricultural products. But if that particular input is already for your human consumption, it is already Okay, fertilizers, seedlings and fingerlings, or your feeds, these are all considered farm or fishery inputs that is used to create your agri or marine products. They are still exempt. If it is not solely for your marine or agri products, if let's say that feed is also for human consumption, it is now subject to tax. Okay? Sir, how about if we have your feeds for pigs? Ano na yung pigrola? Pigrola, oh, that is exempt. How about the feeds for dogs? It is now considered taxable. Okay? So farm or fishery inputs. Ultimately, it's still for human consumption. Next, we have your personal and household effects. 
So for personal and household effects, this is again uh, for exemption of importation only. So a while back with your uh, uh, agri or marine products in regional state and your fish or farm inputs, it is whether importation or domestic sale. But for personal and household effects, only for those that is imported, not for domestic sales. So here is specifically provided under the law, the importation of personal and household effects belonging to the residents of the Philippines returning from abroad or non-resident citizens coming to resettle in the Philippines, provided that such goods are exempt from custom duties under the tariff and custom codes of the Philippines. So yung mga gamit daw ng mga bumabalik dito sa Pilipinas, whether they are resident or a non-resident, if ever they have personal and household effects, they are considered exempt for any business tax. But take note, these non-residents, they must be resettling here in the Philippines. So what are the requirements under this item? Subsection letter C, it belongs to residents or non-residents. And then it must be exempt from custom duties because once it is taxable for custom duties, then it is also considered as subject to business tax. So ano yung personal and household effects? Yun yung mga gamit nyo, uh, damit, sapatos, basta mga gamit nyo, any personal effects or household effects gamit sa uh, gamit mo personally or gamit pambahay. Okay? That is for letter C. Take note, it belongs to resident or non-resident. Letter D, professional instruments and personal effects. So importation of professional instruments and implements, tools of trade, occupation, or employment, wearing apparel, domestic animals, and personal and household effects. So this is for your different uh, professionals going here in the Philippines. So what is exempted here on your importation is not only the personal and household effects, but also the professional instruments. So whatever professional instruments that is also imported here in the Philippines, including their personal and household effects, are also exempted for business tax. So take note, this talks about importation, but not domestic sale. Okay. First, of course, it must be belonging to persons who come to settle in the Philippines. So normally, these persons are different professionals because they have professional instruments and they have also personal and household effects. Another requisite is that there must be uh, it must be accompanied by, of course, a person upon arrival or within 90 days. Upon arrival of the professional instruments or personal and household effects. Okay. So your importation of professional professional instruments and personal effects must not come alone. They must be accompanied by either a person upon its arrival. So together with the person, pagbalik niya dito sa Pilipinas, daladala niya yung professional instruments and personal effects na yan. Or within 90 days, pagkadating ng mga professional instruments or personal effects, dumating din yung taong may ari nun. Okay? Specifically, this item is provided for those professionals who is coming now into the Philippines. Another requisite is that it must be accompanied by a bona fide. It is accompanied by a bona fide change in residence. Okay. Remember in subsection C, you must already reside or resettle in the Philippines. But in subsection C, what is only included is your personal and household effects. 
However, here in your subsection D, now what is included here is your professional instruments and professional household effects. Okay? Normally, it is for your different professionals. In subsection C, it is important that there must be a reset link. In subsection D, it is also important that together with the imported good or service or professional instruments and personal effects, it must be accompanied by the person who owns it and there must be a change in residence from the uh, foreign country to the Philippines. And lastly, it must not be for commercial must not be for commercial quantity. Okay. So for example, you are a you are an IT information technologies. Is there a word te information technologies? Okay, information technologies. So you are an inter information technologies. Uh, you are coming from a foreign country to the Philippines. So you uh with you are your personal effects, of course, yung mga gamit mo, tsaka gamit mo sa bahay, but you also have your professional instruments such as your different uh, personal computers or different computers or whatnot used for information technology. Now, uh, going home, you have different items with you, your personal and household effects, and then you have your item for trade, occupation, or employment. However, in your item for trade, occupation, or employment, so let's say you have a laptop, you bring home or you brought home 10 laptops, okay? So, or let's say 15 laptops or 20 laptops. If that is 15 to 20 laptops, it is already for commercial quantity. Normally, if you're a professional, you only have at least two or three of that particular item. So, uh, I don't know if ever the current setup now parang meron three monitors with a uh, particular information technologies. But if ever that is for uh, 10 quantities already, that is already considered as a commercial quantity. So it depends. There is no, has and, uh, there is no hard and fast rule as to the commercial quantity. But take note, it must only be for your trade, occupation, or employment. That particular amount, that is enough for you to continue your profession not much, much items that is now considered as a commercial quantity, okay? So again, in subsection C, that is only for those who want to resettle in the Philippines. Subsection D, those who are professionals that is now resettling here in the Philippines. So we exempt both the professional equipments and those personal and household effects. So what are the requ requisites again? It belongs to a person who comes to settle in the Philippines, and it must be accompanied now by the person himself, or within 90 days, the person who owns it arrives. Sir, what if uh, we have your professional and personal effects? And then, umuwi na po siya dito. Nakauwi na po dito yung professional instruments and personal effects. Pero, umuwi lang yung taong may-ari after 180 days. Ano pong mangyayari dun sa professional instruments and personal effects? Since one requisite is not present, it will now be tax. Okay, take note, the person together with the professional instruments and personal effects must also come home. Number three, there must be a bona fide change in residence. It must not be a fleeting time only of professional instruments and personal effects. Hindi pwedeng pumunta lang dito after 10 days, aalis lang din naman pala. Okay, so there must be a bona fide change. And lastly, it must not be for commercial quantity. Only those items or number enough for your continuing trade, occupation, and employment. Okay? That's for the uh, for subsection D. Again, we try to differentiate subsection C and subsection D. We go now to subsection letter E. So growers and Millers. Services by agricultural contract growers and milling for others of palay into rice, corn into grits, and sugar cane into raw sugar. Take note, we talk here about services. And normally, this is on your domestic 
sales, domestic sales only, growers and millers. For us to understand this subsection, we are uh, to discuss what is a grower and what is a miller. Grower is uh, normally engaged in the production or raising of agri or marine products. Okay. Sir, what is the difference of this subsection, subsection letter F and sub subsection letter B? Remember in your subsection letter B, that is the sale of your uh, fertilizers. We have your uh, seedlings and fingerlings, including feeds. Okay. And then in your subsection letter F, we have here your growers. Now, in subsection letter B, what is exempted here is the sale or importation of the different items used to grow these agri or marine food products. If your business is specifically for growing only, if your service is for growing, you are still exempt. Okay? Sir, meron ba yan? Yes. Meron yung mga uh, farmland na nag sila ng mismong farmers, yung service ng farmers to grow that particular farmland or that agricultural property. So the service of that agricultural contract growers are exempt. So they produce or raise agri-marine food products. What is exempt here? The service of the contract grower. You are contracted to grow that particular agri or marine food products. Please do not uh, forget the different items uh, and please do not uh, interchange the items. So in letter B, what we have, we sale, the sale or importation of those items used to grow your agri or marine food products. In letter A, the marine or food products itself. In letter B, those used for the agri or marine food products. In letter F, those services of people behind the agri or marine food products. Clear? Uh, sale or production, letter A, letter B. Sale or importation of those used for agri or marine products, letter D. Uh, letter F, those used or services used for the agri or marine products. So grower, sila yung nagproproduce or nagraise ng agri or marine products. Miller naman, Sila naman na yung nagmi-mill, of course. Ang hirap naman i-define ng miller. So miller, these are those, uh, these persons are engaged in the services of milling those food products. So for example, si grower uh, nag-grow ng rice. So ipapamil muna nila yon Paano ba? Alam niyo yung rice na meron pang brown siya. Sorry, uh, I'm not really into agri so I don't know about it. So we have here your rice. Yung meron pa siyang brown. Yung, alam niyo yung rice, iba green siya. Tapos meron siyang parang, ayan, ayan ba, yan yung rice. Tapos meron parang ganyan na kulay brown to. I don't know what you call it. And then this rice here uh, will be milled para lumabas na yung, yung rice talaga. Yung puti na rice. I don't know if I make sense. Can you please uh, educate us regarding this brown and yung white? Okay. So, yung brown, I don't know what to call it. And then we have your rice. So, the whole rice itself, if you, if you will already, uh, what do you call this one? If you will harvest it, it has the brown one, like the skin. And then it will be milled so that you have your rice. Basta pagkatinanggal na yung brown one, ang tawag sa kanya ay... Anong tawag sa kanya, guys? Can you please comment it? Rice Big has... Big. Ano? Rice has daw? What do you call it? Ipa. Ipa. O, basta yun. Nagkakaintindihan naman tayo, guys. Okay? So, uh, what I want to say here in your letter F is the service here. Service. Hindi ikaw mismo yung nag-grow or nag-raise nung particular agri or marine food product, pero you contract someone to grow that 
So the service of that particular person who grew the agri or marine food product is exempt. Okay? And if you will mill that agri or marine product, so service milling naman na yan, it is also exempt. So in this letter F, dalawa ha, grower and miller. Grower, sila yung nagpapa-raise uh, or nagproproduce ng agri or marine food products. Miller, sila naman na yung nagtatransform ng produce into an actual rice or corn, if I make sense. So the palay into rice. Aso palay ang tawag sa kanya pagka may brown pa lang. Tapos pag binil mo siya, magiging rice na siya. Hmm. Corn into grits. So corn ang tawag sa kanya pag binil mo siya, grits. Wow, I'm learning. Actually, I'm just memorizing this one before. So now I'm learning what is milling really. So ma palay into rice. Corn maging grits. Cane into raw sugar. Wow. Thank you for this. Okay, so grower is different, miller is different. I hope you uh, took the differences between A, B, and F. Sir, how about E? I think we did not discuss letter E. We we start with letter D, right? Letter D is the professional equipment and personal household effects. Letter F is the growers and millers. What is letter E? Letter E, ah, uh, OPT. For letter E, that is your OPT. We will discuss it when we go to your other percentage taxes or those items subject to percentage tax. Next, we have your letter G. Letter G. Okay? Letter G talks about your health services. Okay? So for health services, we have your medical dental, hospital, and veterinary services except those rendered by professionals. So take note, we have your specific medical services that is exempt. Okay? Uh, by the way, guys, in your actual practice soon, you do not tell a particular business you're exempt on a business tax. Because I remember when I started working, uh, I worked as a professor in a university and uh, as a part-time, I also do uh, internal audits and audits as to different uh, hospitals. So I have clients before into hospitals. When I work into them, I started to look first on their financial statements and so that they are subject to output tax. And now herein, I know that health services are exempt to tax. I learned before that uh, if you are exempted, you are really exempt. However, in actual practice, it doesn't mean that if you are exempt, exempt ka agad. You must apply for an exemption. So there must be an exemption certificate provided under the BIR for you to claim exemption. If ever you are into health services, let's say, so medical, dental, hospital, veterinary services, but you did not apply on any of these exempt transactions to the BIR, you are still taxable, okay? So even if your particular transaction is exempt, if you not if you did not apply for exemption, you are still taxable. Sir and Daya naman. Yes, although Madaya siya, remember, tax is the lifeblood of the government. Therefore, it is up to the taxpayer to specifically point out the exemption, to claim for exemption. Without pointing out that to the BIR, the BIR will not tell that you are exempted. You must first secure an exempt search certificate. Okay? So for health services, whether this is inpatient, outpatient, or laboratory, they are considered exempt. Sir, what are those different items? Actually, when I started into uh, venturing into hospital services, I don't know about these items. They, they just uh, gave me a, a brief background. When we say inpatient pala, these inpatients are those who are, uh, how do we call this one, admitted inside the hospital. So inpatients. Outpatient, normally these are the persons who are only into medical checks, uh, medical checkups, x-rays, etc. Laboratory, any lab tests made into the hospital. So these are different hospital services. But take note, when we talk about your hospital or health services, it does not include those of professionals. 
Sir, question, can we import health services? Generally, no. It is only for your domestic sales. Domestic sales. So, this domestic sales of health services applies whether you are private, you are a government hospital, or you are a non-profit hospital. Any type of a particular institution, so long as you have these health services, these four, medical, dental, hospital, and veterinary, you are exempt. Okay? You are exempt. But take note, you does not, uh, we will not include those of professionals. So if you are a professional and then you have a health service provided, this is already taxable. Sir, how about if ever we have medicines? That is part of health service, right? So you are in a hospital. Normally, hospitals have medicines. Medicines are taxable also. Why? It is not included. It is not included in the enumeration. So medical, dental, hospital, and veterinary. When we talk about hospital, inpatient, outpatient, and your laboratories. Okay? That's for health services. There is a question here in the chat box. Sir, sa medicine po is yung exempt? Po ba is yung medicine na ginagamit po ng patient? Or included yung seal of medicines po to patients? Okay. So here, take note that uh, specifically in your health services, we have your medical, dental, hospital, and veterinary services. So any service that is uh, within those items. So let's say in hospital, normally you have your inpatients and a hospital has a pharmacy, right? So if ever anything that is for that particular service or rendered for that service, then it can also be considered exempt. So the question here is, what if the medicine is used to use for the patients? Is it exempt or not? A while back, we said that medicines is taxable. If medicines taken in the context of a pharmacy outside sold uh, a pharmacy is situated outside and that pharmacy sold medicines these medicines are not within the context of health services but if that medicine is within the context of a particular health service so let's say in a hospital a hospital normally has a pharmacy okay so uh, it is necessary for that hospital to have medicines. Of course, how will you take care of the patients if you don't have those medicines? So the medicines, if consumed during the hospital service, so let's say during the lab test or laboratory test or during the hospitalization, it is still within the hospital service. Okay. So again, to answer the question, if ever the medicine now if ever it is sold to the patients in the hospital service, is it exempt? Yes, because it is within the definition of the hospital service. So the medicine that is sold by the hospital is necessary for its, for its uh, hospital service. Sir, how about if ever that particular medicine is sold only to those not inside or not for hospital service? What do we do? We already tax it. So if it's a transaction outside, it is taxable. But uh, take note, if it's sold outside or it is uh, sold by a pharmacy not into either medical, dental, or hospital veterinary service, then it is subject to tax. Okay? Uh, in actual practice, what we do before, what I do before when I try to audit them into the hospital service as to pharmacy, whatever is the total pharmacy medicines, sold is still exempt. Why? Because normally those inside the hospital does not really look whether ay ikaw ba ay bibili na nakakonfine ka ba dito or hindi ka nakakonfine dito. They don't normally ask those questions. So my assumption is that the pharmacy inside the hospital will always be exempt. Will always be exempt as part of your hospital service because uh, it is a necessary part of your hospital service. Sir, question. What if I have an hospital and then my canteen dun sa hospital? Yung canteen ba is necessary for the hospital service? Generally, no. Kasi yung canteen, it caters now anyone. But if ever you have a diet specifically for the hospital service, yung mga dietitians, you know, it is still within the context of the hospital service. Okay? Uh, actually, these items are already for practice, for practice questions. However, since uh, one of you raised it, 
I'll try to answer them. Okay, so take note, if ever that particular service is within these health services, it's still exempt. So again, medicines is necessary for your hospital service, therefore the medicine is exempt. So if ever uh, during hospitalization we have medicines, the pharmacy sold medicines or the uh, medicines is consumed by the patient, then it is still exempt. Okay? We proceed to the next one. We have your educational services. So educational services is one of those uh, items for nation building, which again, uh, used to meet the different purposes of the constitution or the different state policies of our constitution. Now, uh, we finished your health a while back. We go now to your educational services. So for educational services, we read the provision under the law. Educational services rendered by private educational institutions, duly accredited by that ed, SHED, or TESDA, and those rendered by government educational institutions are exempt. So this educational service provides two exemption. One, on your private educational institution, if they are accredited, take note. For private educational institutions, they must be accredited by either DepEd, CHED, or TESDA. But for government educational institutions, there is no provision whether they are accredited or not. Therefore, since there is silence as to your government educational institution, no need for accreditation. Why? Kasi parang katangahan naman na may-ari ay gobyerno, i-accredit niya rin yung sarili niya. Di ba? Parang ang weird na ikaw yung may-ari, i-accredit mo yung sarili mo. That's so weird. That's why the uh, law does not provide for accreditation of your government educational institution. But for private educational institutions, of course, they need accreditation. So that uh, the minimum standards provided under our law is met by the educational institution, okay? So for private educational institution, it must be accredited, either CHED, DepEd, or TESDA. And then we have your government educational institution. Bottom line, any educational service is exempt. Educational service is exempt. Next, uh, we're done with letter G a while back. Hospital, we're done now with letter H. We go now to letter I. Okay, for letter I, we have your employment. Letter I, employment. So services rendered by individuals pursuant to an employer-employee relationship is exempt. Why so? Because an employer-employee relationship, you are not in business. Okay? You are not in business. Inherently, that is not considered a business. So you, if ever you are into employer-employee relationship, you are exempt to business tax. No business that is under God. Sir, what if the employment is in the form of a self-employment? Normally, self-employment, you know this one as doing business already. Okay? So when we talk about employment, that is only your employer-employee relationship. But if the employment is already self-employment, it is already doing business. So for example, agents, they are already doing business. Self-employed individuals, they say they are self-employed, but actually they are undergoing business transactions. So self-employment is subject to business tax, while employer-employee relationship employment is not subject to business tax because inherently, employer-employee, there is no business undergoing between the employee and the employer. So the employee is not into business in unemployment. So again, in employment, let's be clear, what is not subject to business tax? Only if ever the relationship is employer-employee because there is no business. But if the employment is a self-employment, self-employment is already considered engaged in business or doing business. Therefore, subject to business tops. So we're done with letter I. Nahihilo ko sa letters. So letter A, letter B, okay, letter I. Let's go now to letter J. For letter J, we have your RA, Regional Area Headquarters. Regional or Area 
headquarters. Okay, so let's read the provision of the law. Services rendered by regional or area headquarters established in the Philippines by multinational corporations, which acts as a supervisory, communications, and coordinating centers for their affiliates, subsidiaries, or branches in the Asia-Pacific region, and do not earn or derive income from the Philippines. Okay, so here we have a term known as regional or area headquarters known as RA. And what is the use of your RA? They act as a supervisory, communications, and coordinating centers for their affiliates, subsidiaries, or branches, and do not earn or derive income from the Philippines. So there are two purposes of RA. First is for admin purpose only. Why do we say it is for admin purpose? Because it is for supervisory, communications, and for coordinating centers. Another is, another requisite is that it does not earn income. Does not earn income. Okay. Sir, so what if it is for admin purpose and you are earning income? Then you cannot be considered exempt. Okay. Sir, so why is RA considered exempt? RA is considered exempt because here, we are giving tax incentive to promote business of a multinational corporation to the Philippines. To promote business of a multinational corporation into the Philippines. Take note, what we have here is a corporation itself. And then this corporation has different sets of branches or affiliates outside the Philippines. So let's say uh, we have here Philippines, we have Singapore, Taiwan, China, whatsoever. So here in a particular business enterprise, this, uh, this business enterprise placed in the Philippines is only for admin purpose. It is not subject to VAT. Why is there it is not subject to VAT? First reason is that for tax incentive. Another reason is that they are not engaged in business. Why? Because again, we define business as for commercial activity. When we say it is for commercial activity, we must earn profit or income. What is with a RA? Take note, for a RA, two requisites must be present. Admin, purpose only, and not earning income. So in number two, you know that it is not already for business. Since it is not for business and purely for admin purpose, it is not subject to any business tax. Okay? So what is a RA again? It acts as a supervisory communications and coordinating center. Sir, question, what if there is already an income? Remember, RA does not earn an income. But what if we already have an income? What do we call it? We call it as RO. RA, RO. Kaya minsan nakakabasa kayo ng RA is, is slash RO. RA, area headquarters, does not really earn an income. RO, operating headquarters, they earn income. RO operating headquarters, they earn income. So if it is already considered as ERO, then it is subject to business tax. Okay. RA, admin purpose, no earning of income. Since it does not earn an income, it is not considered as a business, no commercial activity. How do we tax it? No business tax. If it's already a row, meaning regional, regional operating headquarters, it earns income subject to business tax. Okay? Next, international agreements. For international agreements, uh, these are based on your different treaties, special laws, we read the provision. Transactions which are exempt under international agreements to which the Philippines is a signatory or under special law, except those under PD number 529. Okay. So here in your international agreements, this is because of your international committee. And normally, international agreements or exemption based on international committee comes from your treaty stipulations, different special laws, or different international agreements. Okay. Take note for international committee to be present or these different items should be present, there must be the presence of PH and a foreign 
country. And the PH and foreign current country are signatories to this treaty, special law, or international agreement. Without the Philippines being a signatory, they are not bounded to that international agreement. Okay? So there are different international agreements that is already presented or provided under the Philippine laws and under your different uh, agreements entered into by Philippine and the foreign countries. So these different uh, international committee agreements or international agreements form part of the law of the land. Since it, is, it forms part on the law of the land, it is already considered part of our laws itself. So we indicate it as part of our NIRC or our taxation laws if there are any taxation uh, areas under that international agreement. If it is an exemption, it is considered exemption. Take note, guys, uh, what is exempted here is a business transaction. It doesn't mean that if we have an international agreement, exempt ka agad. Nasasundan, titignan nyo muna kung ano yung laman ng international agreement na yan. If this international agreement provides for business transaction exemption, then it is subject to an exemption to business taxes. But if it does not provide for a business tax exemption, then it does not provide. Okay? So it doesn't mean, guys, that if there is an international agreement, inherently, you are already exempt. You must know the provisions of that international agreement. In this case, the provision must point to a business tax exemption. If it does not point to a business tax exemption, no exemption. So what are some examples? We have your ERI, as I told you a while back. You also have your Red Cross. Uh, we have your transactions in the embassies. So uh, transactions, this is one of the most. Uh, common examples of business transactions which are subject to international agreements or special laws. The transactions in your PESA, Philippine Economic Zone Authority. So if you are in an eco zone, generally, you are not subject to business stocks. Okay? So for international agreements, one important requisite is the Philippines is a signatory. Next, that particular international agreement must point out to a to an exemption of a business transaction because if there is no pointing out of a business transaction that is exempt, it is merely an international agreement. It's specifically, that international agreement must provide for the exemption on a business tax. Okay, That is letter K. Let's go to letter L. Letter L talks about your agricultural cooperatives. So for agricultural cooperatives, it provides here that the sales by agricultural cooperatives registered with the CDA to their members as well as the sale of their produce, whether in its original state or process form, to non-members. Importation of direct farm inputs, machineries, and equipment, including spare parts thereof, to be used directly and exclusively in the production and or processing of their produce. So this particular provision provides for items of business transaction that is considered exempt. First, the sale of the agricultural cooperative to their members. Next, the sale of the produce to non-members. Third one, the importation of direct farm inputs. Okay. So the first is the sale to non-members. Uh, the sale to members. If ever we have an agricultural cooperative and there is a sale to members, it is exempt. A sale to members is considered exempt. Okay. So there is no... Uh, there is no provision under this code that the sale must be in original state or not. So any sale of an agricultural cooperative to members is exempt. I hope we are clear here. The second exempt transaction for your agricultural cooperatives is the sale to non-members of their produce. Okay? So take note. In your sale to members, whether you produce it actually or not, 
it is exempt. In sale to non-members, only their produce. So why do we say that when we have your agricultural cooperatives, whether it is their produce or not their produce, it is exempt. It is provided by their law. Take note, if we sell something, it can be your actual production or it is a purchase or a purchase from the outside suppliers, let's say. Okay? So if it is a sale to members, whether it is from your own produce or purchase outside, it is exempt. If it's sale to non-members, only of their produce, whether or not their produce is in its original state. So the original state in the sale to non-members does not need to be uh, present. So take note, it is whether or not in the original state, so long it is a sale to non-members. Lastly, we have your importation of farm inputs. So any importation of farm inputs by an agricultural cooperative is an exempt transaction. So what are these farm inputs? It can either be your inputs used for the production, such as your fingerlings or seedlings. It can also be your uh, machineries, your equipment, the spare parts thereof. So anything used for farm inputs are exempt if it is imported. Sir, what if the agricultural cooperative has a domestic transaction of farm inputs? Is it exempt or not? Take note, what is provided under your law is only the importation. If that is a domestic transaction of an agricultural cooperative of a farm input, it is now subject to a business tax. Okay, Only the importation, not the domestic transaction. Okay, Take note, what are the items on your agricultural cooperative? Guys, do not memorize agricultural cooperative as exempt transaction okay when we talk about business transactions that's either buy and sell so it is not right to tell to tell that agricultural cooperatives are exempt because under the law we only have three transactions of agricultural cooperative that is exempt first the sale to members next the sale to non-members of their produce whether or not in the original state lastly the importation of farm inputs only these items if not then it is subject to business tax. It is also worthy to tell that for cooperatives, actually cooperatives under your business taxes are generally exempt. So these are generally exempt. And under the rule, if ever it is selling to members, exempt yan. Okay? Selling to members, exempt yan. Non-members, it depends if the provision provides for its, ex for its exemption or not. Okay? And then finally, if that is unrelated activity, it is taxable also. Okay. Therefore, for cooperatives, you must know that cooperatives can sell to members or non-members. And the cooperatives may undergo activity that is either related to them or not related to them. If that is members, I told you it is exempt. Non-members, you test it whether it is exempt or not. If the activity is related, of course, it is exempt. If it's not related, it is not exempt. So unrelated, it is always taxable. Okay? Related activity is that. So look here, in your agricultural cooperatives, what are normally exempt? Only those with the related activities, such as your sale to members and of your agricultural produce, and sale of produce to non-members. So those are related activities. Okay, so I hope you are clear as to your agricultural cooperatives. Let's proceed to letter M. Credit or multi-purpose cooperatives. So another cooperative. So gross receipts from lending activities by credit or multi-purpose activity, uh, multi-purpose cooperatives duly registered with the CDA. So for a credit or multi-purpose cooperative, what is exempt? The lending activities. Okay, why? Because we said all those related are exempt. And what is related on a co cooperative undergoing credit or multipurpose cooperative? 
that is your lending activities. So lending activities are considered related, therefore exempt. Take note of the different rules that follows your cooperatives. If that is sales to member, exempt. If non-member, depending if ever uh, under the law, it is exempt or not. If it is related, exempt. If it's non-related, it is taxable. Sir, what if it is members and then unrelated? So here, you are not already under your related activity, so you are taxable. Pumasok kasi yung isang item which is taxable. So if it's members and then related, both exempt, exempt, so exempt. Non-members related, if the non-members is exempt and related is exempt, so exempt. If the non-member is taxable and it is related, although related is exempt, one portion of it makes it taxable, so it is taxable. If it's member and unrelated, since unrelated is taxable, it is now taxable. Okay? So generally, when do we exempt it? If it's members and related to its activity. Okay? Other cooperatives. So for other cooperatives, how do we look at it? Sales by non-agricultural, non-electric, and non-credit cooperatives duly registered with the CDA provided that the share capital contribution of each member does not exceed 15,000 pesos and regardless of the aggregate capital and net surplus rapidly distributed among the members. Okay, so we already discussed the uh, rules on your cooperatives. Members, exempt. Non-members, depende if it's taxable or not. If it's related, exempt, unrelated, taxable. So if it's sold to members and it is unrelated, it becomes taxable because it is an unrelated activity. So generally, what is only exempt? Only those sold to members and it is related. Okay? Now, uh, take note, non-agricultural, non-electric, and non-credit. Why? On your non-agricultural, it provides now that for your agricultural activities, such as your sale to members, sale to non-member of their produce, and then importation of inputs, it is already exempt. Na non-credit, we discussed a while back for your credit and multi-purpose cooperatives. If that is for a lending activity, it is exempt. For non-electric, sir, why do we include here non-electric? We did not discuss yet electric. Because guys, if it is electric cooperative, if it's electric cooperative, generally you have a business tax. So almost all cooperatives except electric cooperative are exempt. Almost all cooperatives except electric cooperatives. Okay? Kaya nga dito, kahit yung mga hindi na nasabi kanina, agricultural, alam mong may exempt. Credit, alam mong mag may exempt. Tapos dito, nagdagdag pa siya ng non-agricultural, non-credit. Okay, so if we try to look at it, agri, there are, there are certain exemptions. Credit, there are certain exemptions. Non-agri is still exempted. Non-credit is still part of your exemption. However, how about electric? Did we discuss electric? There is no exemption provided kanina, di ba? Uh, when we went to letter L and letter M, it is only agricultural and non-credit. But for electric, did we discuss? None. Therefore, this is taxable. But the other non-electric, it is already exempt. So if you look at it, almost all, all cooperatives except electric cooperatives. But there are certain items only or transactions in between these cooperatives. So for these other cooperatives, which are considered non-agricultural, non-electric, and non-credit, what is the requirement? Provided that their share capital contribution to each member does not exceed 15,000 pesos. If it exceeds 15,000 pesos, what is the effect now? It is subject to business tax. Okay, so I told you a while back in our introduction, that one of the uh, rationale for your exempt transaction is your tax incentive. And when we talk about tax incentive, that is to promote businesses 
or transactions on a particular business activity. And one example of that business activity is the business activity undergone by, by a cooperative. Normally, cooperatives are not entered into. What are the normal businesses that you can see? Those are sole proprietorships, partnerships, and corporations. Rarely do you see cooperative. So to promote the use of cooperative, the uh, law on your business transactions does not provide for the taxation of these cooperatives. So almost all cooperatives has an exemption, except electric cooperative. I hope you are clear and we know what items under agree and credit and those non-agree, non-credit, and non-electric. We discussed that in item A, letter L, letter M, and letter N. So letter L, agree cooperative, letter M, credit and multipurpose cooperative, letter N, other cooperatives. Letter O, export sales. You already know export sales by persons who are not VAT registered are exempt. You already know this one. Exportation under your uh, principle, under your uh, consumption principle for your different business transactions is exempt. So destination principle provides that exportation generally is exempt. Sale of real properties, letter P. Sale of real properties not primarily held for sale to customers or held for lease in the ordinary course of trade or business or real property utilized for low cost and socialized housing and other related laws uh, and below house and lot and other residential dwellings valued at 2,500,000 pesos and below, etc. Okay, so we look at this under your sale of real properties. So for real sale of real properties, sabi dito sa ating provision, if it is not primarily held for sale to customers or held for a list in the ordinary course of trade or business, it is exempt. Okay. So for real properties, that is either non-dealer or dealer. So when we say it is non-dealer, it is not held for sale to customers, not held for lease, or not in the ordinary course of business. If you are non-dealer, it means you are not doing business. If you are not doing business, then you are not subject to business tax. If you are a dealer, of course, you are undergoing business, therefore subject to business tax. As a general rule, a dealer of a real property is subject to business tax. So dealer is subject to business tax when we talk about dealer, either sale or lease of real property. What is the exemption to this rule? The first exemption is low-cost and socialized housing. So first, low-cost housing. For low-cost housing, it is and uh, it is provided that low-cost housing must be uh, exempt under business tax. Low-cost housing must be exempt under your business tax. And what is the provision that provides for that? That is letter P. Letter P. So sabi dito, low-cost and socialized housing valued at 1,500,000 pesos and below, house and lot, and other residential dwellings valued at 2,500,000 pesos and below. Provided that beginning January 1, 2021, the VAT exemptions that only apply to sale of real properties not primarily held for sale to customers or held for lease in the ordinary course of trade or business. Okay, so... First, we have here your low-cost housing. So under your low-cost and socialized housing, what is the value provided? So the value provided is 1,500,000 pesos and below. Okay? Low-cost and socialized housing and other related loss residential lot valued for 1.5 million pesos and below. Okay? And then we also have your residential dwellings. Uh, 
under residential dwellings valued at 2.5 million and below. So locus housing, take note, locus housing, socialized housing, and residential lot, 1.5 million pesos. Residential dwellings, 2.5 million pesos. Take note for your uh, locus housing, what's the difference of a locus and socialized housing? For locus, it is for your low-income family beneficiaries. For socialized housing, it is for your underprivileged and homeless beneficiaries. Okay, locus for your low-income beneficiaries. Socialized housing is for your underprivileged and homeless beneficiaries. Take note, if ever you are a dealer and then you sold a real property, real property valued at 1.5 million and below. So dealer, nagbenta ka ng real property, 1.5 million and below yung cost niya. If ever you sold that, at 1.5 million pesos and below, you still exempt for business tax. Okay. Sir, what if binenta ko siya at 1.9 million pesos? It is now subject to business tax. If that is 1.9 million pesos, it is already subject to business tax. Sir, how about res residential dwelling? So sabi dito, and other residential dwellings were 2.5 million pesos and below. So if the value is 2.5 million pesos and below, it is exempt to business tax. So what's the difference of a residential property or residential lot and residential dwelling? If that is residential lot, you only sell the lot itself. If, if it is dwelling, normally that is house and lot already. So if it's lot, 1.5 and below, exempt. So if you sell house and lot, you are considered dealer, ah? it is already taxable. Okay, we go back to your sale of real properties. If you are non-dealer, it means you are not undergoing business. Since you are not undergoing business, you are exempt. But if you are a dealer, since you are undergoing business, you are subject to business tax. So what is provided under our law? If that is 1.5 million pesos and below for your low cost and socialized housing and Residential lot, 1.5 million and below, it is subject, it is exempt. Above 1.5, it is subject to business tax. Res residential dwelling, 2.5 million and below. If it is worth 2.5 million and below, exempt. Above that, it is subject to business tax. But take note, guys, on your socialized and housing units, I think there was a different provision on the value. And for your locus housing, I'll look into it as to our value. But now as to our real property and residential dwellings, it is 1.5 and 2.5 million. And take note, guys, beginning this year, sabi dito sa law natin, beginning January 1, 2021, the VAT exemption shall only apply to sale of real properties, not sale of real property utilized for social housing, as defined, real properties not primarily held for sale to customers or held for lease in the ordinary course of your trade or business, sale of real property utilized for social housing, sale of house and lot, and other residential dwellings of not more than 2 million pesos. So as of 2020 now, 2021 now, this exemption shall only apply to not held for sale to customers. If it's already held for sale to customers, it is already subject to business tax. Okay? So this old provision is not already applicable. Look for the January 1, 21, 2021 provision. And under this provision, if you are a non-dealer, don't ka lang exempt. If you are a dealer, you are taxable. Okay? We end our session here. We will continue still on sale of real properties and we look into our new provision, January 1, 2021. Uh, I provided to you the whole provision of the law instead of some only provisions. Yung iba kasi, uh, what they do is they just list down. Don't just list down them. As you can see, there are different transactions within that provision. So you need to read the whole provision. So please 
reread the whole provisions and look into the change as of January 1, 2021. Okay, we will discuss that next meeting.